listening, and I hope you're doing well tonight. Let's see if anybody's on here yet. I'm seeing the bot and about it, so... Okay, maybe people will come in soon. In the meantime, I thought I would talk about, uh, since I did incarceration last night, I thought I would talk about disability and homelessness, which is a huge problem in our community. So let's go look it up. So I'm going to screen share. Well, now I've got blue. That won't do. That won't do. I'm going to do that. Now, yeah, that's better. <laughs> Lighting. I'm learning about this stuff. Okay, so let's go look up. Disability and homelessness. Okay. All right, let's look at what Social Security says about people experiencing homelessness. Individuals experiencing homelessness who have a disability have the same rights and privileges for in applying for disability benefits as someone who is not homeless. You should inform us during the application process if you are experiencing homelessness so that we may better assist you with your application. You can find more information about how to apply for benefits by clicking on the link, links below. SSI is for someone who has never worked. Social Security Disability Insurance is for people who have paid into the system for at least 10 years. So if you've worked for at least 10 years, you are eligible for Social Security Disability. However... If you have your own business and you don't have money withheld for FICA taxes, then you are not eligible, which is ridiculous, really. Um, but Social Security is not a given, and that is a problem in our country. Um, so... Let's look at the Interagency Council on Homelessness. First, I will give this link and go over here. Because it's good to have makes things harder. If you don't have a regular address, then how do you get your, you know, how do you get a bank account? How do you get your um, check? So there are services that you can get, um, a post office box or a, uh, some kind of, um, uh, box, but if you have no money, how are you going to pay for it? So lots of problems around general homelessness, period. So let's go to this link. Interagency Council on Homelessness. And I wish I could sign up for the newsletter, but my mailbox is full. <sighs> so, 
All righty. There's that. And this is the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. So Let's see what I'm trying to do is get the title. All right. United States Interagency Council. On homelessness. What a mouthful, right? So let me do that. <laughs> Excuse me. And I'll put the link over here so y'all can follow along if you like. Okay, let's see what the site... Oh, I have a viewer. I have a friend on here. Jane ENV, welcome. Welcome, welcome. If you have any comments or questions for me, please do type it in. And if you don't, that's fine too. Everybody's welcome at Granny's house. So we're talking about disability and homelessness. So let's look for disabilities. Coverage of housing-related activities for individuals with disabilities. This is from 2015, though. Let's see. Let's look up something a little more timely. Um, connecting supportive housing and health systems to end chronic homelessness among people with disabilities. Let's look at that. Okay, so we're going to... Put this link in. So we will go back and get the title. Boom. There we go. Alrighty, I'm hoping there will be some juicy statistics in there that we can talk about. Of course, homeless homelessness is a problem the world over. But uh, I'm looking at the United States right now because that's where I live. But I want to look at the international view too. We have to work to expand the supply of supportive housing opportunities for people with the most intensive needs and connect individuals to the health and behavioral health supports necessary for promoting their housing stability. So, these are three case studies. So, let's see. From Portland, Oregon, Central City. Okay. This describes a partnership between the health system and supportive housing providers in Portland, Oregon, that led to the creation of 375 new units of housing and a new clinic and services space. Important stakeholders who made it possible what brought the health sector to the table, the challenges faced, 
and advice for other communities seek, seeking to develop partnerships like it. And it's also talking about sustainability. So, Central City Concern has provided housing and addiction services since the late 1970s. It was first created to assist individuals experiencing homelessness who were struggling with alcoholism and a lack of permanent stable housing. It not only owns and manages real estate for people with low income and individuals and families experiencing homelessness, approximately 2,000 units, but also provides health and behavioral health care at a federally qualified health center at several sites, which include housing. Okay, in 2001, it got the Old Town Health Care Clinic and began to integrate it with their operations. Um, in 2003, Old Town Clinic became a federally, federally, federally qualified health center. In 2007, they developed the Re Recuperation Care Program with two area hospital systems. Within a few years, all major health care systems in the metro areas were partners in the RCP. So, um, in 2012, it was invited to participate in a group including all the CEOs of health care entities and directors of three public health departments in the metro area investigating the possibility of jointly creating a coordinated care organization. And the Affordable Care Act, as it was implemented in Oregon, also resulted in new requirements for health care entities to serve as medical homes responsible for long-term health outcomes and reductions in unnecessary hospitalizations and emergency department visits. It also encouraged new approaches that address the social determinants of health. The ACA went into effect in 2014, and by the end of 2015, the impact of homelessness on the efficacy of the medical home approach was becoming ever clearer. In early 2016, they um, met with CEOs of the hospital systems and the major Medicaid MCO to discuss potential for capital investment in low-income housing and new clinical operations. So they invested $21.5 million to build three projects, which would result in 375 units of housing and the new clinic and services space. So, took another three months for the their to work their way through. They became Health Share of Oregon, which services Medicaid Medicaid beneficiaries in three counties, and supports implementations of the requirements of the ACA. So. They uh, got a whole bunch of uh, health agencies involved, and the ACA provided incentives for hospitals and healthcare systems to focus on long term health outcomes. And there was some research. So Okay, so the, the original organization that was CCC says it's important to develop and maintain strategic relationships within the community and to recognize how interacting with a large healthcare system may differ. It's also very important to find who has credibility with these organizations and ask for their help in bringing people to the table. 
Organizations need to be prepared to do a lot of groundwork establishing and building relationships. Find champions within the healthcare system. Understand the decision making process of the organizations you're working with. Look for how to align and understand the intersections where you can build a collective effort. Be strategic. Discover the reasons that individuals got involved in healthcare and their desire to be more deeply connected with the community and understand that organizations may be leery of working together when they're coming from a very competitive environment. Good advice. <clears throat> so they are... Um, A comprehensive research and evaluation component of the project has been implemented and very important to ongoing quality improvement and sustainability. So, research has shown and continues to show the positive impact that stable housing has on health. Most lay people don't know that developments termed affordable housing are not necessarily available to individuals and families experiencing homelessness because a minimum income and or rent is required in order for such developments to be financially sustainable. A large capital infusion reduces the debt load and extends the impact of limited rent subsidies as the subsidies do not have to be as deep per unit to house very low to zero income residents. So people tend to think that housing is available because they see all of these um, affordable housing complexes, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Otherwise, we would have solved the homelessness, homelessness problem years ago. So, the health, in, the health is Housing Collaboration decided to continue to explore future initiatives to address homelessness. They also added three major Oregon foundations and the largest metro area business association to the collaborative. And... Um, So they're continuing to do stuff. So that's just one example of how one community approached their homeless problem as far as people with disabilities. And we really need more collaboration between the major players in any community. We need to uh, help people who run large health care units and people who have maybe affordable housing and connect that to grants from the government so that you've got a lot of players involved and it becomes more complicated the more players are involved. But homelessness is not simple. It's not as simple as just, well, let's build more low-income housing because getting partnerships between people in private industry, they've got to pay their rent right. So when they rent out places, they've got to be able to afford their expenses. So, and we tend to, we renters tend to think, oh, landlords are rich. Why do they charge so much rent anyway? But they've got expenses they've got to pay. So, yes, they want to make a profit, but they also have to be able to have enough money to float their households. So they have bills they have to pay. So it's not a simple thing at all. It needs a lot of communication between all the parties involved. And when you're trying to, um, you know, 
getting legislation through to allow this sort of thing it can be difficult because a lot of legislators say well how are we going to pay for this but what they don't realize is we are already paying for this anytime you have a homeless camp there are expenses to the community that the homeless camp is in to uh, go in and clean it up so you don't have outbreaks of horrible diseases when you have crowding and when you have lack of sewage treatment and things like that then problems get bad very fast so I'm not going to go through the other case studies but um Just um, putting that out to point out the many problems that there are getting people to work together and just increasing understanding of what the problems are and what the solutions are. And it takes a lot of work. For these organizations to do anything that's why they're not in all cities because it takes concerned individuals working together to create a, um, a solution it would be nice if the government gave us a framework for that but unfortunately every community every community is different and the political situation varies from town to town even and it's often at the county level where we have to come together and create what is not there so if we had universal health care it would make this a lot easier there would be a structure for communities to build on I get very frustrated with our system. It's going to take some very smart people to come up with a plan that works for both sides of the aisle. And it's very difficult. But we have to realize how much we're spending already of our tax dollars to combat these social ills and homelessness is a huge problem and it is snowballing because so many people can't afford a place to live so and for people with disabilities if you can't work you can't get an income if you have worked maybe you can get social security disability but having gone through that process if I had been homeless I don't know how I would come up with the paperwork absolutely um, I talked to a homeless man you can find homeless people in uh, safe places like Walmart parking lots if you go to the furthest part of the parking lot near the street you will probably find a homeless person um, I found this man lying on the grass and we had gotten together a bucket of basic supplies and so it was, felt kind of risky but I walked over and I called to him softly I said mister and finally he woke up and sat up and he looked at me and said hi <laughs> so I got to talking to him he was about my age and he told me his story his name was Mark and he was hanging out there because he was afraid to go to the encampment off of Highway 41 um, there well there's probably one near Chattanooga too this was in Chattanooga and he said that he was beaten up and whoever beat him up took his cell phone and he was complaining that he tried to go in the Best Buy because he was getting Social Security 
So he tried to go in the store. And of course, since he's been out in the street a while, he's, you know, his clothes are not, you know, he didn't appear that raggedy to me, but they wouldn't let him in. And it's, it's like, you know, people don't realize that a lot of homeless people, half of homeless people go to work every day. And there are a lot of families with children who are out on the street living in their van or whatever. And we need to quit thinking of these people as bums because if you're disabled and you can't work, you are not a bum. You are, you know, you need help. And if you're not getting any help, you end up on the street. It is very sad. You know, as I listened to this man's story, I was going, well, you know, he's probably somebody's grandfather or somebody's father, and why aren't they taking care of him? But people get estranged from them from their families, partly because of the shame of being homeless. So homelessness is a serious, serious problem. And when you look at rents, rents are just so high and, you know, it's not necessarily the landlord's fault. They've got to eat too. So their payments are high, so they have to charge enough to cover their expenses and a little extra for maintenance and like that. So, you know, maintenance is expensive. So you've got all these problems. And the solution is for the government to step in. That's what government is for. It should step in and do what we can't do as individuals. And we really need attitudes in the United States to change. We need to have more compassion for people. We need to quit thinking about how much money is involved and think about well we are already paying billions of dollars a year on incarceration and it would be cheaper to provide health care for everybody so that people are not moved to steal to pay for an operation that somebody in their family needs which is a common situation or people have bills they can't pay and they end up doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing. But, you know, a lot of times people end up in jail because they just feel hopeless and they're at the end. And last night we looked at how many mentally ill people were in jail. It's over half. So, Let's look at the homeless population and get some statistics. Let's see if we can find... Um, how many disabled persons are homeless? Let's see if they have an answer. Nope. All right, let's put that out here. Okay. Let's look at, um, let's see. All right, Easter Seals is a pretty good source. Over 40% of homeless in the U.S. have a disability. That's a big deal. Let's 
So that's a lot. And let me get this out. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> Aww. So this is, um, this figure of 40% comes from the 2008 Annual Homeless Assessment Report. It says, among adults, 17.7% of the U.S. population had a disability, whereas an estimated 42.8% of sheltered homeless adults had a disability. A disability, particularly one relating to substance abuse or mental health issues, can make it difficult to work enough to afford housing. The report points out that people with disabilities are an even higher share of the homeless population than the people who are poor. This suggests that people with disabilities face additional difficulties more than those who are poor when it comes to accessing permanent housing. They may have difficulties searching for a unit or finding a landlord willing to rent to them. Their disability may make it less easy to accommodate them without adaptive supports. The average annual SSI payment is about 44% below the poverty level, and thus people with disabilities who lack a sufficient work history to qualify for SSDI is common among people with severe mental illness or substance abuse issues. They're more susceptible to deep poverty. So... The inability to work often puts the price of housing out of reach. It's a very scary thought for those of us who have disabilities, and especially for people who have disabilities that are less obvious. Autism, for example. Certainly there are programs and initiatives set up, says Christina Chu, but what is actually working and what is not? So let's have a look at that report. That is the 2008 one. And the link doesn't work. Hmm. They probably re rearranged it. Let's look at the sitemap on HUD.gov. This is Housing and Urban Development. So let's look at... Homelessness and Disability. Maybe there's a more recent report. 
Disability overview. Okay, I wish it had dates. Let's see. 2019 annual homeless assessment. All right, let's see if there is a more recent one. Doesn't say how this is ranked. Let's see. Let's see what the date is on this. Okay, basically the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 provides that no qualified individual with disabilities should solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from any program receiving federal financial assistance. Okay, so all right, so federal financial assistance includes all these programs, including public housing, Section 8, which is really hard to get on, supportive housing for persons with disabilities, and um, ADA, of course, um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in all of um, all the government, basically. Um, and federal non-discrimination laws define a person with a disability to include any individual with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So it includes but is not limited to examples of conditions such as orthopedic, visual, speech, and hearing impairments, cerebral palsy, autism, epilepsy, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, HIV, developmental disabilities, mental illness, drug addiction, and alcoholism. So um, major life activities include walking, speaking, hearing, seething, seeing, breathing, working, learning, performing manual tasks, and caring for oneself. And there are other major life activities not on this list. So, so it's not enough to just uh, be a user of illegal controlled substances but if you have addiction then you're protected so all right so then there's um reasonable accommodations under there. So I will put that in our list. I wish I could find the report that it was talking about, but this is what I found on the HUD site, which provides housing low-income housing. Um, so that's the disability overview. But that's not exactly what I was looking for. But I'll put it in the chat anyway. And I'll see if I included the over 40%. Yeah, I did. Okay. So it helps to go to the primary sources instead of
places that mention these things. So, um, okay, so let's look at. All righty. I'm not seeing. Let's see. Let's just look up homelessness. The 2019 Annual Homeless Assessment Report. This is from 2020, so they should have had one this year for 2020. This is for 2019. Um, that's a, an increase of 14,885 people since 2018. Um, homelessness among veterans and families with children continued to fall, declining 2.1% and 4.8% respectively in 2019. But then COVID hit, so it went back up. Um, there's a lot of local variation. Okay, so I wonder why there's not a more current, let's see, let's look up 2020 and homeless, because I know there was a report that's, um, okay, all right. And I like Ms. Fudge. She's good. Okay. So homelessness increased significantly between 2019 and 2020. Veteran homelessness did not decrease compared with 2019. Homelessness among family households did not decrease for the first time since 2010. Um, people of color are significantly overrepresented among people experiencing homelessness. Very troubling, even before you consider what COVID-19 has done to make the homelessness crisis worse. Okay, so all right, so key findings. About 18 of every 10,000 people in the United States experienced homelessness across the United States. Whoa, that's a lot. After steady reductions from 2010 to 2016, homelessness has increased in the last four consecutive years. And um, there was a rise in unsheltered individuals, and this increase impacted the large increase in, experience in individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. Veteran homelessness did not decline. Youth homelessness is slightly down. People of color are significantly, significantly overrepresented. So, but there's a problem with the count. 
they go on one night a year and go physically count people who are on the street. And they miss a lot of people because they don't find all the hiding places for homeless people. So um, it is uh, difficult to measure homelessness. So most officials will think that these figures are low compared to what they're actually seeing. If you talk to people who are... um, I've read articles of interviews with people who run services for the the homeless population, and it is um, very disturbing that, you know, we've got, so as far as the disabled, um, When you think of disabled homeless, you think of disabled veterans, right? But there are a lot of people who can't work, and that's why they're homeless. So we really need to attack the homeless problem. And where we need to start is in our county zoning. We need to reduce square foot sizes on homes to allow people to make their own tiny homes so that they can build less expensive but still up to code housing and tiny homes are not profitable for all the large builders so they don't want to build them but people can build their own and up to code there are lots of instructions out there for people who are handy. And the risk of fire in smaller structures is more. That's a problem. But if you had planned tiny home communities with fire hydrants, then you would be, you know, less likely to have fire spread, you know, But we need to figure out a way to house more people without having a whole bunch of um, rules that restrict it to more affluent. populations of the homeless. It's just um, general homelessness is increasing. So let's look for some particular stats on disabled people among the homeless. So let's go back out and See, and I'll go back. Let's see, this, what's the date on this document? Uh, Okay, let's see. Well, this should be up to date. All right, let me put this here. So, this is good. And 
and let me get the title. This is just plain homeless on the HUD site. FAQs on the homeless. And put that there. It's not giving me stats on people with disability. Okay, more information about the homeless. Okay, head exchange info. Let's see. Populations and issues. Well, doesn't have anything on the disabled specifically. It has stuff on veterans. Let's look at how many families are. Let's see. Doesn't really say how many either. And as I said, there are problems with the statistics because they only count homelessness once a year. We really need every community to be counting the homeless at least once a month. And I know it's labor intensive, but there needs to be a way that we keep track of the homeless so that we know how many homeless we have so that we can, you know, um, so that we can target homelessness with programs. The problem is you go and start asking homeless, you know, for their names and information about them. They are wary because of all the police, all the laws that target the homeless. We need to decriminalize homelessness because it's not all crooks prowling around your yard trying to break in and steal. It is people who simply can't afford a place to live. So we don't need to, we need to provide places that people can park, especially in the case of domestic violence. If a woman has a car and she can escape a hurtful situation for a little while, you know, the places that she can park are severely limited now. A lot of places have no overnight parking, period. And that is discriminatory against battered women because where are they supposed to go? So we need to quit criminalizing people sleeping in their cars because it's a fact of life nowadays that people get evicted and they need some place to go that is safe where they won't get their cell phone stolen because your um your any papers that identify you if those are stolen how are you going to apply for help because it's so expensive. It's $25 in Georgia for a birth certificate. It used to be three. This is discriminatory against homeless people because how can they afford to get a copy of a birth certificate to prove how old they are? It's very, very bad that we don't have a system in place so that a person can be identified. There are people who die on the streets every year and they can't identify them. And this is horrible. Somewhere this person probably has family and maybe they were too ashamed to admit to their family that they were out on the street and now 
you know, they show up dead and they don't have dental records and that's how they identify people who have died. So we should be providing dental services. So at least we can identify a person who shows up dead on the street. But we really need to have housing for these people. So there we go. So disability and homelessness. Alrighty, so let's see what Nacho is. I'm not familiar with this organization. Let's see, what is Nacho? National Association of County Health Officials. Oh, okay. This is a good source then. All right. So, let's go back. So, Nacho. All right, this is from 2019. So I'll put this here. And get the link. All righty. So just because I didn't know what Nacho was, this is a, a good source. All right, so I'll put it. Oh, hi, it's good to see you, Mess. Sometimes I was um, worried about you. It's nine o'clock. Good to see you. Do you got any questions or comments? It's good to see you. I I was worried because I hadn't seen you and I was wondering how you were doing. I imagine school is a busy time. They give y'all too much homework. I really am an advocate of reducing the amount of homework that we saddle our, our young people with. It's um, too much, but I'm glad to see you. Oh, yeah. The being tired goes along with any disability, pretty much. It's just the stress of being disabled that hits you in the energy department. So it, it takes more out of us disabled people than it does normal people, I think. Oh, I know it. How have things been going since that? Have, have things kind of calmed down at school for you? Oh, no. I'm so sorry. What is the school doing about it? Oh, that is sad. This is the problem that I have with public schools after having experience with uh, several school systems because... Um, when I got divorced, I moved around a lot because we had, <sighs> really, that's verbal abuse. They need to stop it. <sighs> oh, 
they totally ignore the effects of emotional abuse on kids. I, when I was in ninth grade, I came home crying every single day. I was 15. I just absolutely, if I had had an online school option, I would have taken it. But unfortunately, there was no such thing back then. Well, they still can't have kids abusing other kids. I mean, come on. They need to have more staff and they need to separate people that are given other people abuse. <sighs> they really need to get a psychologist involved because the the education community and the psychology community technically don't really do that much interaction. There are a few special projects where APA, the American Psychological Association, has um, partnered with schools and sent um, people into the schools in their, you know, in certain areas. But really, um, education as a whole needs to embrace child psychology and use healthier techniques to solve their problems. Oh, I am so sorry you're going through that. That's just terrible. I, having had two daughters with ADD and getting calls from the school all the time while I was trying to work, it really put a lot of stress on me, and I would go down and talk to them and really get nowhere. Well, the thing is, there needs to be some one-on-one -on -one talking to this person and try to get them to be kinder and gentler. And it really takes, you know, he really should be in therapy and he really should be getting some help because he apparently feels that He's got to pick on other people to feel normal or good. And that's not healthy. It's not a healthy way to be for all those around him and especially for him. Wow. Yeah, but suspended, he's not going to get the help he needs to be a better person. You know, it's it's just sad all around although I'm I know you're relieved because you won't have to deal with them for a week and oh my goodness it's just bad and I feel for his parents or whoever's taking care of him because oh somebody's gonna probably miss work because of that it's just there needs to be supports for families that good, good. I'm glad. I'm sorry that you're having so many problems. This school is hard enough. Yeah. School is hard enough without having to deal with abuse. And let's call it what it is. That is verbal abuse. That is not acceptable at all. Hmm. Oh, goodness. Boy, I am very sorry that you're going through that. So, um, how is the school doing on masking and social distancing? 
ah, well, it's good that you're learning jujitsu, but it's, um, really? Nobody's wearing masks? Is there a big controversy over masks? Uh, I think as a country, we are, uh, oh my gosh. This is totally, I think, going totally in school and not having online school as an option, I think for some people it it is just, oh gosh. Uh, well, kids dare kids. I mean, that's just part of the picture. They'll... They were doing stuff like that back when I was in school. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, just to get attention, probably. Um, it's sad, but this division in our country is really affecting how it is in school, and it's not right. We should be loving each other. We should not be at each other's throats over a little piece of cloth to go over your face so you don't infect 59,000 people. <sighs> it should not have been politicized, but we have stupid government. <laughs> oh... Uh, not all of it. We have some good people trying to do some good stuff, but gosh, this is, it's going to be a disaster. There is this new variant they've discovered, the C.1.2. Yeah. It's just sad that he feels like he's got to bully people. He may have been very badly abused and he may be acting out, you know. It's uh, it's a hard thing for everybody concerned. It's I'm glad that you were able to stand up to him and Oh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's, um, there's all kinds in a school, and, um, good grief. Ah, oh, man. You've just got it from all sides, haven't you? Hmm. Yeah, I, I figured that was two separate people, but... Oh. oh, my. Yeah, I think part of what's going on, you know, we've got this political divide in the country... We've got all the pressures of COVID, and none of us are really coping with COVID very well. And well, but you know, you just got to hang on. It's hard. And being persecuted, there's nothing. It's very hard to explain to somebody who's not being persecuted. But I had so much going on in ninth grade. And I still, it still hurts. And I'm 62 years old. It's, it just, um, if I could have, 
just stayed home and not gone to 7th, 8th, and ninth grades, I would have been very happy because I was getting so much persecution. The, uh, the good personality interactions that I was having with my friends was largely negated by all the people picking on me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bless your heart. But, you know, people act out when they're not getting their needs met. And it's sad that some of them choose to just persecute people and it's really hard when you're at the brunt of that and getting picked on and <sighs> you certainly don't need that mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I'm I'm not going to... Let's not use the word stupid. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. But um, you don't get used to it. That's a crock. You know, my mother said that I would learn to handle things and that it wouldn't bother me as much, but it never did. It, it never got better. It always just stung me to the core. And I was really sensitive when I was 15. And so uh, I liked it when I went to high school because people pretty much left me alone. And a lot of that was because I got in one of the work programs and I wasn't at school as many hours. But it just... It was really, really hard for me um, to make friends. Yeah. I know. It's, it's just very, very hard for you because, you know, not only are you handicapped, but, you know, everything on top of being handicapped hurts you more and it you know once you had that uh, well a mental a mental problem is a disability you know no disabled means that it's harder for you to do normal things. And as somebody with a mental illness, I've got the uh, borderline personality disorder, which makes me very emotional. And I was a powder keg when I was in junior high, really uh, just trying to hold it all in and just full of emotion all the time, and it didn't take much for me to just go, you know, completely bonkers. And when you... Oh. Well, you know, whatever the diagnosis turns out to be, you've got, you know a bigger trial than kids that don't have, you know, um, mental disabilities, okay? And when I'm talking about mental disabilities, um, borderline personality disorder is one, but back then they thought it was anxiety and depression. I didn't get diagnosed with BPD until I was... 
40. So whatever the label is immaterial, when you've got all this emotion and you are putting yourself down all the time because everybody is putting you down, you know, it feels like the world is putting you down. Well, there's a whole grief process that goes with disability. When you are, it's hard to admit disability because we want to think of ourselves as normal. We want to think of ourselves as, you know, um, we tend to think of disability as a weakness that we have some control over and you don't. You have the the body you've been given with the brain chemistry that you've been given and you got to remember you were abused. That does not go away. You can mitigate it. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a disability, but don't think of it as something to bash your self-esteem with, okay? There's a grief process associated with that, and one of the stages of grief is denial. You know, you want to be normal, and you put up this front, and you put on the smile, and you say, I'm fine, but you're not really. And one of the things that I learned in therapy was to accept my disabilities and to, uh, and that acceptance varies from day to day, still, even at 62, but I had to learn that it was okay if things bothered me more than they seemed to bother other people. Bless your heart. Well, anger is uh, a response to all of this turmoil inside. And it's a normal response. It's a lot more acceptable to be angry than to fall apart and cry. Yeah, yeah. And there is that price. Every time I had, uh, you know, every time I came home crying, you know, then I'd get this headache from all the crying and all the upset. And it was really miserable. And my mother really didn't know what to do. For me, because it was very hard to accept her kindness towards me. Bless your heart. Yeah, all that emotion gets to you. And how I see disability is that, you know, it's just harder for us to reach that normal bar than it is for people without disabilities. And they often don't understand how hard that difference is. And it's easy to bash yourself and say, oh, I'm worthless, I can't do this, and, you know, and, and just, you know, you're your own worst enemy for a while while you're doing that. The thing I learned in therapy was not to bless your heart. Yeah. Bless your heart. It's so hard. But the trick is not to attack yourself. Because you're doing the best you can, dude. You are doing the best you can. And if you are just, you know, if you just... Breathe and just try to, and that will help with the nauseated feelings too. If you breathe, that the oxygen helps that. If you can just get yourself to breathe slowly and just try to calm down the, the anxiety just a little bit. And it's really hard if you're yelling at yourself. So you try to make friends with that yelling part of you and, and try to, you know. Well, 
Well, staying in school is important because so much in life depends on, you know, getting an education so you can work, so you can support yourself. So what you want to do, though, is you want to not blame yourself for these things that happen from people attacking you. When you're persecuted like that, you tend to think, oh my gosh, it's more than one person. It's got to be me, right? But a lot of times, people just, they see you react to what they do, and it motivates them to do it more. I don't know why that is, but the more you know, they'll pick on somebody who they can see a difference. I mean, I'm very, very pale skinned. So if I get embarrassed, I just get red and it's very obvious. Or if I get really upset, I'll get pale. It's really obvious. And, uh, Yeah, yeah, and, you know, it took me a lot of time to get comfortable in my own skin because I always felt like I was never good enough. I was never, um, you know, my sister has all these accomplishments and I have nothing <laughs> You know, I was an honor grad from high school, and that's about it. But bless your heart. It seems like, uh, you know, that your regular teachers could do some things to accommodate your learning disability. Yeah, yeah. We tried special ed classes for my older daughter, and it did not work. She wasn't getting, I thought she would get special tutoring to help her with her ADD, and she did not get that kind of help. The class was too big. The teacher had too many students who needed a lot of individualized attention. It just Basically, she was drawing pictures all day. And so we took her out of special ed, but getting teachers to accommodate her disability was really hard. And kids made fun of her for taking meds at school. And then she decided that she just wasn't going to take the ADD medicine anymore. And that was her choice. I let her do that. But it's just, it makes it so much harder when you've got kids picking on each other. They they really need to do something as a school system to not tolerate this. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't get... um. They had a pod system when my older daughter was in fifth grade, and I thought it was a good idea. They basically had an area where their class was separated from the other classes, and they they ate lunch in their pods, and so they were kind of, um, I don't know what the solution is. I'm not sure if the pod system is better than having everybody exposed to everybody else, but I know from the issue of COVID that definitely it would be better to have them in pods rather than having everybody mixing with everybody. And especially since COVID is airborne and this, uh, I've been following this guy on Twitter that has really good research proving that COVID is truly airborne and WHO and CDC are still into the particle thing and saying that social distancing is enough. It's not. 
they need to have UV sanitizers in the HVAC system, which would only cost about $200 a unit, and it wouldn't be that expensive for all schools to equip even older schools' ventilation systems with that and with a uh, CO2 monitor with a display so that you could see the airflow in the room. Yeah, yeah, I know. And the being with the special kids singles you out and makes things worse maybe for you. It's the whole inclusion thing is hard because you know you okay, how to put this? Well, in other words, somebody, another adult talking to me, they would never realize that I was mentally ill. And, yeah, school generally is not kind. Mm -hmm. And there used to be that when I was in school. They've always had that. And there was a girl in the special ed class that was making fun of me. She was making fun of my glasses. She was making fun of my teeth. She was because I had an overbite. I still do, but um, I had braces for five years. But, you know, it just got to me. And it wasn't just her. It was like 10 different kids that were saying things to me that just hurt my feelings to the core. Middle school is hard, and um, are you in? Are you in tenth grade? You said you were no. You said you were a sophomore, so you're ninth grade, right? Tenth. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So um, yeah, the they had the freshman, sophomore, and, and stuff in middle school, and then it started over in high school. So, yeah, 10th grade is still at that border, and it's, you know, it, it for me, things calmed down in 10th grade, but part of it was because I gave up on the, uh, um, the smart classes and went to the less challenging classes because I just couldn't stand the pressure to go to college. Yeah. So, but I was largely out of the social thing totally. I never was part of any popular groups. I had some friends that were very popular. But they were always surrounded, you know, like bees in a honeycomb. Um, so I didn't get to interact with them very much. And um, it um, was hard being on the fringes. Yeah, yeah, it's just really hard to try to just go to school and study and, you know, try to be in the background. I was always trying to blend into the background, and I couldn't because, you know, something about me attracted these people on me because I was vulnerable. And it's, um, it's like predators will go for the wounded animal. You know, there's something about you that they just hone in on. Well, you got to be yourself. You got to be true to yourself. And the problem with that is that what if you can't blend in? I mean, because not because your behavior is obvious to everyone that you've got a disability, more that bullies 
will hone in on you if they know you can get a they can get a rise out of you if they know that you're you know because they prey on vulnerable people and yeah maybe there's not you know it it is so hard and school is just so hard Glad to see you again, Officer McNasty. Oh, okay. Well, I was always the kind that was wearing the bright colors. I didn't like pastels, so, you know, um, maybe that was one thing that set me apart. But basically, I. I mainly listened. I didn't talk a lot. When I was in school, I was very introverted. And so I I just found it hard to talk to people because I was always editing and re-editing and re-editing what I was going to say before I said it. So it was really hard to say anything that I felt like wasn't going to be wrong. So, true. Cool. Well, it's good that you do put yourself out there and answer questions. It's, um, it's a very good thing, and it's a way to get positive attention, too, which everybody needs. But maybe some of these folks are jealous. I had very good grades, and I had people getting mad at me constantly because I would not let them look on my paper during a test. And that was like, nope, I don't do that. <laughs> And so I got a lot of flack because of that. A lot of people were jealous. And the thing was, they could have gotten the same grades. They were smart people. They just didn't want to work for it. They just wanted to copy off of somebody else's paper. And that's not how it works. But yeah, I agree with Officer McNasty. You got to be yourself because if you try to be someone else or try to tone yourself down or don't answer questions in class, you're just hurting your grades. Yeah. Bless your heart. Yeah, 15 is just a rough age. I um, I had so many problems when I was 15, and I wasn't even um, going through being trans or anything like that. I was just, you know, regular anxiety, depression. I was a nervous wreck, just scared of everybody. But um, bullying, like one out of seven kids is a bully. And, you know, I think schools should do something about this. They should give people adequate time to have lunch breaks. I was just shocked when my older daughter had 15 minutes to snarf down her lunch. And, you know, I came to school one day and ate lunch with her, and it was like 15 minutes. I could hardly finish my plate in 15 minutes. It was nuts. I think young people ought to have rights. They ought to have a right to have recess, and they ought to have the same kind of playground equipment that they have in public parks. You know, adults like to swing. 
Why can't they have that in high schools? Ooh, cool. I don't think they should take recess. That is not right because the answer to um, fights and stuff like that is not to take away social interaction with people. They need to have supervision so that if somebody's bullying somebody, that is verbal abuse. <sighs> That's awful. I had recess in elementary school. But in junior high and senior high, we got our recesses taken away. And I resented it so bad. And having to run to my locker, you know, and have five minutes to get to class. Ugh. Yeah, I don't agree with the mentality that goes with that. Because if they gave kids 15 minutes to go walk around and do something physical, they would get some of that mess out of their system, you know? Yeah. I mean, recess is a time to... Go outside, walk around, connect with nature. We had a, when I was in junior high, we had woods all around our school, and it was in a residential neighborhood. It was a very pleasant place. And without going off campus, I could walk around, you know, outside the school building, and there was um, not a lot of grass, but there was some grass, but the trees were nearby, so it was like, you know, a big release for me. And I really enjoyed that. Got a kitty behind the computer. <laughs> but um, taking away recess just adds more stress because now you've got that five minutes between classes to run to your locker, get your books, and I guess y'all have most of your books on your iPads now, which is good. But yeah, good advice, officer. Very good advice, because, um, uh, Definitely. Oh, that's awful. Because the CDC guidelines say get out in the outside air. I mean, they really need to let y'all go outside. It's just barbaric to expect you to stay in the, in the building and exposed to all that virus. <sighs> I really think it's a mistake that every county has full jurisdiction over the schools in that county. I think that there should be guidelines by state of how long lunch has to be and having recess and letting kids go outside. You know, a lot of workplaces have, you know, Park benches that you can take your lunch outside and you can sit outside on your break. It ought to be a requirement that you've got some way for, oh, well. Bless your heart. Well, the fact is, as human beings, we need people. And it's hard to find friends when you're 15 because everybody's into, you know, the, it's tied to organizations that they're in, or it's tied to sports, or it's tied to, and I was physically disabled. I couldn't do sports. So a lot of my friends were doing sports, but they, hang out, they hung out with the sports people. So there I was, you know, 
I, um, yeah, yeah, the clique system. I'm very familiar with that. It it was so hard. I didn't ever have a group of friends. I had one friend that was my best friend. Yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> I can remember so well. I'd be talking about things that nobody ever heard of and yeah all the teachers were my friends absolutely i was asking them for advice i was you know talking to them every day and the other kids would look at me doing that and go wait a minute what what she got that i haven't got you know so i got a lot of jealousy about that because I related more to the teachers than I did to other students. Well, I don't think I was ever a teacher's pet, but I certainly talked to all the teachers, and I just loved my teachers, you know. And I related to them more than I did my friends. And, uh, you know, my best friend was kind of... Well, she was kind of shy, but she'd hang around while I talked to the teachers. And um, we drew a lot. We made up characters. And so we'd write notes to each other with our cartoon characters. <laughs> you know, um, had a great time. And then in 10th grade, she got interested in boys. And it was like, where's my best friend? We're not best friends anymore. It was terrible. But um, it's that way, you know, that uh, border between ninth and 10th grade was very difficult for me. And I just really, um, 10th grade for me was a lot different because people left me alone all of a sudden. It was like the bullying just stopped and I was able to, you know, go to class and do my stuff and um it was a lot different but I can't explain why it was so different it was a different school it was a bigger school we had 300 kids in my junior high and my senior high was a thousand so maybe everybody was off bothering someone else I don't know but But you do have to be true to yourself. And sometimes I really didn't know myself that well at 15. I tended to just get on my own case so much that I really didn't know my good qualities, my strengths, none of that. And through going into therapy, I learned a lot of that. And I realized that I do have worth. And I'm not an egotist or anything. But now I can feel like most of the time that I'm a person of worth just like everybody around me. And so I feel one with the world because everybody has worth. And before I came to that point, it was like everybody but me has worth. I felt like I was subservient to everybody and I wasn't getting what I needed. And it, you know, I was just a mass of roiling emotion <laughs> when I was 15. <laughs> I was such a mess. Oh, my goodness. So, um, I feel it. I feel what you're going through. I, cause I went through a lot of the same. My situation is not the same as yours, but I definitely, the persecution, the verbal abuse and all that was going on at home. It, it was just so much that I could not handle. 
my life at all. It was very hard to think about the future and think that anything good was going to happen in my life. But I got through it somehow, and I started learning to, you know, let myself make mistakes because we learn through our mistakes, right? And mistakes are not something that you should bash yourself with. And when other people pick on you, it's not a sign that you've made a mistake. And it took me years to get to that point. Because when people were picking on me, it felt like, well, ah, so many people are picking on me. There must be something wrong with me. But I was feeling it more because of all the anxiety and depression that was going on. And that's something that when you've got something like that going on, it makes it harder for you to appear normal, to blend in all the the whole picture. And the more you stick out, the more you get picked on. But on the other hand, You need to be yourself and be true to yourself. So even if you stick out, you're still going to get picked on even if you're in the background. And that's something that all of us have to deal with in, well, if you're 15. Because once I hit college... I loved college because nobody was picking on me. I wasn't having any uh, conflicts, power struggles, nothing of that. So when I went to college, I just really felt like, you know, I, I was still a mess. But it wasn't external. It was more internal. And as I went through therapy and and progressed there, it just changed my life. I learned to accept myself. And at times, I still have that conflict of feeling like I'm not doing enough. I'm not, you know, uh, all that picture. But that, you know, you're going to have conflict with yourself anyway. That's just part of being human. But Most of the time, I feel pretty balanced and pretty happy. And happiness is one of those things that you have to work on it. You have to look for the little things in your day. What keeps me going, especially since I'm, you know, homebound, I don't get out much. We did go out today, Um, but, oh, I'm going to run out of power very soon. Let me get this wire and plug my computer in. But, um, the happiness comes not from money or fame or any of the things that we think will give us happiness. Happiness comes from just little things. It doesn't have to be something big and amazing like winning money or something like that. It can be as small as you happen to be up and you see the sunrise and just letting that childlike wonder come over you watching that sunrise or sunset or seeing the stars if you're out at night or seeing a beautiful flower as you're walking by on the sidewalk. Just grab on to these neat things and let yourself feel that childlike joy. Like when you were in kindergarten, everything was wow. You know, if you can get in touch with that inner child, it helps a lot. And sometimes it can just cut through some of that stress to experience things through a child's eyes and let yourself feel that excitement of um, something pretty or something that's, wow, you know, maybe some project that some kid at school made. There's always something, if you look for things that 
are pleasant. They don't have to be like, wow, exciting, but just something that's pleasant as you're going through your day can help you hang on. The little anchors, little blessings that are there whether you notice them or not. But if you take the time to notice them, then it's a little boost to your day. And a lot of those little boosts can get you through a day that is not going well and, you know, you're feeling bad. And just being able to enjoy some things, you know. It can be as simple as talking to a teacher and just having a pleasant conversation. So, you know, any of that helps the the total you. So I'm hoping that's helpful. Anybody got any thoughts? So, Miss, sometimes I am very glad to see you because I was worried about you and I'm sorry you're having these struggles. It's one of those things, but I hope that you'll come back and I hope that you feel free to to talk about stuff because this is Granny's house. Everything goes here, except bad language. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be careful about that. But, um, you know, it's good to come here and be able to talk about things. And I can talk about my experiences, and they're different. But there are some threads in common between all of humanity. Everybody feels down sometimes. Everybody feels like, oh, I messed that up sometimes. But, um, and I'm no stranger to that. At 62, I still flub up, say the wrong thing. And it's like, what did I say? But, you know, you get over it. You, you move past it. It's quicker for me to move past things now that I'm 62. Experience does help that. Um, I don't get as upset about things as I did even in my 40s. So I have mellowed out as I've gotten older. So, you know, but when I was 15, every day I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to, you know, be unliving. And, you know, I worked through a lot of stuff and I eventually found out that life is worth living. And I'm really glad I didn't become unliving. I'm really glad that I made it through it to this point and I enjoy a wonderful relationship with my daughter who never would have been born if I had succeeded. So, you know, at being unliving. So it's a lot to think about that over the course of your life, what's going on right now may seem so big and terrible that you feel like you're just not going to survive this. And especially at 15, I was feeling that. But I made it through. And because I made it through, I was able to do the things that I do now, including having this live stream. And um, I may never be famous, and I probably never will be rich, but I don't have to be. As long as I've got enough money to pay my bills, I'm happy. So, you know, um, life is worth it. And I hope that something that I've said will help you in your journey. 
so mess sometimes. I love you, and I want you to know that you're always welcome here at Granny's. And I always want to hear about how you're doing. And Officer McNasty, thank you for the very good advice and comments. And I think I'm about to wrap up. So let me see who's here. Alexia XO, Janiv, and Miss Sometimes. So y'all are showing up on my chat. So I'm hoping that uh, things improve Miss Sometimes on your school year. And I'm going to be eager to hear how your day went tomorrow. So if you think about coming on. And in the meantime, I'll give it a few more minutes so anybody who wants to comment can comment. And if nobody has anything to say, I think I'll go ahead and end. But for my handicap minute here, I think I'll, um, on the uh, subject of homelessness and disability, I want to say that we need to notice the homeless more because there's more homeless around than you think. And since they are constantly moved from place to place, um, the place I usually see them is the Walmart parking lot down near the road on the way far end of the parking lot. And... Um, we should be telling the managers at Walmart that we want to allow overnight parking so that women with domestic problems have a place to go. That's, you know, Walmart parking lots aren't the safest places, especially at night, but at least there are cameras and, uh, you know, it's, may be safer than a situation at home that's dangerous. But as far as schools and COVID and just protecting the mental health of our youth, I do want to say that schools need to end bullying. I've been saying this for years. I'm still saying it, and I'm still tweeting a lot about it, that kids need a Bill of Rights. So for anybody 12th grade and below, there should be, you know, I think there should be an hour lunch, but at minimum, it should be 30 minutes, and they should be allowed to socialize. And that should be supervised by the teachers. I know teachers want a break from their class and they want to be able to sit at the teacher's table and all that, but I think that we need to have rights. Kids in school, teens and, and kids, should have the right not to be abused in the classroom and all of this bullying that goes on whether it is you know they intervene when it's physical but when it's just verbal they tend to just let it go and that's toxic they should not be doing that they need to have more people in the schools to supervise to step in when these things are happening. We need to have a movement where we encourage other students to step in and say, I'm part of this community and I don't want this happening in my community. You know? We need to have safer school environments for mental health. Everybody needs mental health. And during COVID, just about everybody is suffering mentally from all of the stress 
of not knowing where this virus is going to go and seeing the case numbers rising again is scary to everybody. And schools need to be protecting our young people because they are being infected at such a high rate that the few that would end up in the hospital are ending up in the hospitals at such a rate that people with heart attacks have to wait in ambulances because there's no beds. So we need to give stronger messages about people being vaccinated. The anti-vaxxers are, you know, being misinformed. So we need to do something about the stream of misinformation that is convincing people not to get vaccinated. It shouldn't be political, and wearing a mask should not be something that marks you for persecution. And I don't know what the solution is, because I'm just a 62-year-old, you know, with concerns, but I really feel like school administrators need to work with child psychologists, and they need to get mental health care for students. And I'm including K through 12 and the university setting. We need to have more mental health care everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream. I'll um, say that I'm very happy that we got to talk tonight, and I hope that y'all will join me again. I'll be here tomorrow night, and hopefully I won't be falling asleep in the middle of it, because tomorrow I've got to go for allergy shots, but um, y'all take care, and I'm rooting for you. So, take care, and hope things get better, miss, sometimes. I really do. Because you need a break. You're a nice, nice person, and you need to have a break. So, y'all take care, and I will see you tomorrow night. Have a good night. And I'll put up my goodbye scene. Bye. Take care. And tomorrow we'll talk about more stuff. Maybe I'll concentrate on schools tomorrow. Take care and let me know if you want me to talk about something. And I will make that a priority. Take care. Good night.